Okay, viewers, thank you for tuning in to Bloomberg Quint on the Mutual Fund Show, a property that we've started every Wednesday wherein you can benefit out of hearing top mutual fund managers, CIOs and financial experts as they talk about their sense on the mutual fund industry, on the markets, on investing in funds and lots more. Two men need no introduction, manage a lot of your money. Uh, a lot of people that I know have invested and invested very happily in the Access MF schemes. And our Siv Kumar, Janesh Gopani, as yeah. I said, need no introduction, but Janman, thank you so much for joining us okay. today on the thank Mutual you. Fund Show. Mm-hmm. Uh, let me start off with a couple of basic questions and then we move on to funds. Um, Janesh, equity market outlook. What are your yeah. thoughts? I mean, are, are, are these good times for direct equity investors or mutual fund investors to invest in the markets? Uh, see, that d- depends on the risk appetite of an investor. So hmm. you have both type of investor. You can either go direct or you can... I think MF is a better route because the risk gets diversified hmm. and uh, money management is all about risk rather than looking only at returns. So normally if you give it to a guy like us or any other fund managers, I think he can well, very well diversify the risk because they know what type of company they are investing into, what kind of risk they are running to the portfolio and because the sheer diversification helps you in terms of avoiding doing the mistakes in the bad times. So when, right. when, time, when tide turns, everything falls and if you fall less and again when you bounce back you bounce back smartly then i think that is where on a cagr basis if you can deliver those decent returns i think that is where investors should uh, look to invest rather than playing a directly playing a market game which is more risky I would say. Mm. but but good time to invest because everybody talks about how valuations are stretched so should people wait for a good time or is this a good time as any so when you measures especially of equity valuation when you look at it, certain measures like price to earnings ratio looks a little higher than normal. Hmm. But you have to remember that's because earnings have been so weak in this cycle because the earnings are always backward looking. That's, right. that's what has been delivered. But the market is always forward looking. So whenever you have these turning points uh, where there's a expected growth momentum in the future, always the price to earnings ratios etc. start to look expensive hmm. so, or, or rich. But when you, if you have, let's say, in between 2003 and 2008, earnings compounded at 30-35% per annum for 4 or 5 years. So what looked expensive in 2004 looked very cheap in 2006, hmm. for example. Hmm. So it's, it's a matter of looking forward. Slightly forward. Then. Uh, and, and the expectation is that we are on the cusp of a growth recovery. Okay. Um, what, about, what about the fixed income markets? I mean, and, and that would determine a large portion of returns of the balance funds yeah. or the other well, debt funds as well. So when you look at debt, we've had the rally, a huge rally in the last uh, three years, right? Uh, but looking forward, the, the view is very different. The view is that inflation has already bottomed out. We are at 3% inflation. Hmm. And that 3% is also because you had a sharp fall in food prices. So hmm. if these food prices normalize and food inflation goes back to the range of four to five or four and a half to five, hmm. you know, there is no great case for interest rates to further fall. Okay. But on the other hand, you've got a new game in town, which is if growth comes back, corporate bonds look very attractive relative to government securities because you sure. you, you get, you know, uh, upgrade stories, you get uh, high yielding uh, bonds that you're able to buy today, which you could not a couple of years ago. So I think the opportunity set in fixed income has shifted away from long duration bonds to corporate bonds. Okay. Yeah, there's a reason why I asked that and I'll, I'll get to that as well. But just before we get to some specifics, a couple of other questions. Uh, Janesh, to you, yeah. AUM growth for the industry, for your fund as well and for your house rather, has been very, very strong. Does it make investing uh, that much more difficult right now because uh, there's so much of money chasing such few stocks which are quality yeah. in that sense, yeah. in, the, in the strictest of sense. So is it becoming a lot more difficult to generate New uh, ideas. That are, yeah, new yeah, ideas so, or alpha. So it's always a chicken and egg situation. When you have an idea, you don't have money. Huh. When, you, <laughs> when you have money, then ideas run out of steam. Right. So it's, it's always like that. But as Shiva said that when you uh, really look at three to five year kind of thing and if you have uh, many sectors which would be evolving and many sectors which would be growing at a, at, at a breathtaking pace, hmm. I think there is fair amount of idea generation which can happen. Okay. But obviously you have to be careful in near term in terms of what kind of ideas you are putting because just the sheer inflows should not allow you to invest into stories where you don't, you are not comfortable. Okay, so, so you have to do your due diligence, you have to do your research and then put money where you are. Even in, even in funds at yeah, this yeah, point yeah. of time. Okay, so my question is, I think and th- we, we get this question a lot from people. As strange as it may be because uh, I think the general premise of investing is that timing the market is not as important as time spent in the market. But to either of you, is this a good time to enter into systematic investment plans in your funds or in mutual funds by and large? 
can I answer that question? Yes. yes. Uh, I'll give two ways to look at this. Sure. One is, if you see the behavior of many investors, they tie, even though they do an SIP, you see that a lot of SIPs fall off during the worst of times. Hmm. Right? That is to say, SIPs fall off when the market falls. But the whole advantage of an SIP is to buy more when the market, when is, the down, market right? is down. So, yes. you do, so that you do the averaging and you buy a little less when the markets run up. Right. Now, okay, you can say that the market has run up, but does it mean the market has ended its run? Very, very it's almost impossible to predict that. So anytime is a good time to be in a systematic investment plan, but it has to be systematic. That is, if you get in today, and let's say there's a correction in the next six months, don't stop your SIP. Stay, stay on the on the path, and make sure your SIP is meaningfully long. So you know, uh, SIPs of 12 months, 24 months are too short. They need to be 36 months, 60 months, or even longer. Right. Or so perpetuity. As or the or case perpetuity. Right. right. Why not? Because, no, but but yeah. which then, then my question, right. Siva, is that which which is the basic right. principle? I agree. But for somebody who's uninitiated, wants to start investing in SIPs, do you think, you know, he gets worried by this whole chatter of, oh, markets are looking overvalued. Right. Each of us are saying that. Should they wait two, three, six months for better levels or that's not advisable? It's almost impossible to time. And the whole idea of an SIP is to remove the time risk. Got it. Right? So you, if you've got X pot of money that you want to invest over the next 60 months or 100 months, now is the time to start. Don't worry about exactly getting the top or the bottom of the market. It's not going to happen. Okay. My financial planner, again, either of you, my financial planner was telling me that it's a great time to get into balanced funds. Um, last week, we had S. Narain, who, who was very vocal about his preference right now of people who are starting to invest, invest in balanced funds as opposed to pure equity funds. What are your thoughts? They may be completely different from both of these gentlemen, but what are your thoughts? So, since I'm an equity guy, I would always go for <laughs> equity. See, on a CAGR basis, if you take any of the funds, last 20 years, it's a 18 to 20 percent CAGR tax-free. Right. So, if you ask me, my personal view, I think equity is the place to be in. Okay. Because you are at the cusp of next leg of growth. And mm -hmm. hopefully, if all goes well in next seven years, assuming that the government comes into power, I think you can go to 9 to 10 percent kind of GDP growth. And in that you will you will have a nominal GDP growth of let's say 15 or 14 odd percent. Hmm. Normally companies grow 2x of that. So the kind of earnings compounding which can happen and, and hence the returns and the ROEs can be big. So why you want to miss that opportunity? But right. anyways. <laughs> so you can differ. A, no, it's not a question <laughs> of differing. I think when you look at mutual fund investments by retail investors, typically tend to be equity. Uh, hmm. You've seen for example 60 to 70 percent or more of uh, retail money in mutual funds in equities hmm. uh, whereas if you look at our own in total basket of investments uh, savings rate from data from RBI for example you know that 80% of the money is in fixed income instruments but typically FDs and other things that get added in. Right. So I think one of the advantages of buying a balanced fund is you're also buying some debt in your MF. Hmm. Right. I think uh, investors for various reasons have, have especially on uh, uh, retail investors or the wider audience have not really participated in bond funds. So a balanced fund is a way to get some good bonds into your portfolio without having to then buy two funds, a, a debt fund and an equity right. fund, and therefore gets a little bit of asset allocation going. So that's the rationale for a bond, balanced is product. Does right? that rationale hold ra right now? Uh, it, it does, at any point of time, right? So you will not want at any point of time, 100% of your portfolio to be equity or 100% Okay. So to that extent, to, to create a good mix, you can use a balanced portfolio. But in the long run, I think I kind of, uh, there is an argument that, that I have to support what Janesh has to say, which <laughs> is that in the long run, it probably makes sense to have a equity bias to your portfolio. But how you build it, whether using balance and equities together or bond funds and equity funds together, I think the choice can be. It also depends on the risk appetite of an investor. If he's a first time, then obviously he would like to come in balance and then test his waters and then go into uh, aggressive equity portfolio. No, that is typical yeah. behavior, yeah. but that need not be the right behavior. Well, maybe. People could <laughs> opt to, even though they are first time, but they can go for pure sure, equity. Yeah, yeah. You can do either pure equity if you, for example, already have substantial amount of fixed income investments outside the mutual fund. Outside the mutual fund industry, right. Okay, great. My final question before we get to specific funds uh, is that would you, within your portfolios as well, have funds classified, I'm sure as per profile, but I mean, I know there are children's schemes available and so on and so forth, but are there funds, um, you know, classified for, for different age profiles? And why I'm asking you this question is that within our viewer base right now as well, there will be some people who would be, say, northwards of 40, 45 years old, some people who are just starting off their earning career. Would you advise different kind of uh, allocation within the funds as well for different age profiles? Can you throw some light here, either of you? Um, this, the the short answer or the quick answer in this is they always say that you know you do 
100 minus your age and that's your equity allocation. Yeah, <laughs> correct? So okay, for a fund. Huh. If you're 20-year-old, 80% of your money should be equity. Okay. If you're 60-year-old, 40% of your money should be equity. Right. That's a, a rule of thumb, rule of thumb for thumb. making that decision between how much to buy in equity and how much to buy in debt. And it broadly, you know, in long-term history suggests that this is a reasonable way to look at building a portfolio. So, uh, who am I to differ? The experts are saying this. Okay, that's, that's, that's a nice answer. Thank you so much for that. Now, to some specific funds, Janesh, uh, I believe tax savers would be very happy with what uh, you know your fund, the Axis Long Term Equity Fund, has done. If I'm not wrong, 16% one year, but I, if I looked at the three year number, it, it was a staggering 70% or thereabouts, slightly yeah, something. northwards of 50%. Now, that, that's, that's really healthy, plus the tax saving benefit as well. I mean, and, and therefore, we got some questions as well. Uh, about what is it that this fund can do because it stands out in terms of its returns. It, the median is about 15-18%, three year is really good, four year may be slightly different. For people who are invested in that fund or wanting to make a fresh investment, is there an indicative rate of return that you would believe the fund can provide? So, so the short answer is nominal GDP plus <laughs> 3 to 4 percent. But, but you're not ideally, aiming for that. Uh, huh? Ideally, if you are invested in a company which is compounding at 20 percent average, I would right. say. Some would be at 10, some would be at and has an ROE of let's say 18 to 20 percent. Hmm. So, this is what the return you should get from the stock. Right. Because it's a reflective in oh. terms of the PE or anything like that. Sure. So, this is what we are aiming at. And as I again said, the history has been 20 years, 20% CAGR, can you create? Maybe many funds have created it. Sure. So if I if I am able to live up to that also, the kind of compounding effect, what it has on the wealth creation is humongous. Hmm. So, if I am able to do that, I'm, I am. I think I would have done my justice. Right. So, you are aiming for that, but you would presume that the average rate of return that a normal investor can expect safely yeah. and nobody is going to hold you to that answer, yeah, yeah. but would be somewhere northwards of 15 odd percent. Yeah. That, that, that should be the a uh, benchmark I would say. Benchmark. Okay, fair call. The Axis focused <coughs> 25 MF, yeah. four year returns 17% has outperformed the benchmark but lags the category average. Is that the right way to look at it? So it's very difficult. See, uh, benchmarks is for us to really have some kind of a uh, sort of a, a benchmark to how you would like try to uh, have your KRAs and in place and you get the appraisal. Right? I think, I think ah. the, what See, as as individual individual I am, yeah. a benchmark is a quick way to figure out is the fund manager doing a job better than what the market has done. I, if you threw a board board and you just said, you know, I'm just going to replicate the market, <coughs> this is what I would have got. So benchmark outperformance is what the fund manager is aiming for. Right. Now, in the peer set or in the wider mutual fund group, there are some funds which take different calls and that's why you have a range of returns yeah and, and there are various factors so, which probably so, affect this call so the well, question yeah. really is when you look at when you look at category average hmm. is what is the category is more important than median what, which, so when you look at the category average for example of large cap equity funds versus mid cap equity funds or sometimes that so called multi cap funds hmm. now so it, a, a lot of <coughs> the times it's difficult to figure out what is the category you that you're benchmarking against uh, 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 that let's say a third party rating agency would print. The fund manager is focused on one thing and one thing only, which is to deliver returns over and above the market benchmark. Of course. Yeah. So, yes, it's useful to look at the fund relative to its peer group, uh, but you need to un you need to be very clear for what peer group you have selected. Okay. In and also, if you yeah. see different fund managers have different philosophies to run there. Of course. Market is available should, yeah. for everyone, right. right? Of course. So, some might be doing very well in certain type of market and some does very well in certain types of market. So, I think from an investor perspective, you should really look into the portfolio, how we are <coughs> building in and what kind of sustainability that portfolio has on a longer term horizon. Sure. No, no that, that answer is well taken, of course. And this is just a few points that I realized are floating around in the market in terms yeah, of yeah. questions. But before I come to Siva for a few fun questions to him as well, one one last point that I wanted to ask you, Janesh, about is the is that mid cap uh, fund portfolio yeah. for you. Now, arguably, you would yourself admit that it hasn't done as well as you would have thought it would have. Yeah. Is, is the tide likely to change? Because I did read somewhere in an interaction that you've done elsewhere that you've made a few changes to yeah, the yeah. allocation style, to the fund manager style, so on and so yeah, forth so, as well. Uh, so, to be very frank, we have a new, uh, new fund manager which is taking over. It. Right. So, we had few exits and because of that, there was some lagging. Now, everything is done. He is looking into the portfolio uh, and his KRA is to be num 
coming in top quartile so that mm-hmm. is it fair call and uh, don't digress on the philosophy so stick to your broader framework philosophy which is quality and don't no don't not getting down to a stocks where you feel that the erosion of capital can be very high mm. so given that mandate he has been restructuring the portfolio and we are on top of it yeah i'm sure you are i mean yeah. some of the other funds returns have been so staggering i know you guys are on top of the game on most cases mm-hmm. just a couple of points that i thought i'll highlight so um, um you know a couple of uh, funds and i was just looking at the returns here now typically we being equity market anchors mm-hmm. don't <laughs> quite really relate to debt market fund right. and the returns and try to analyze it very well but as looking at the access equity saver fund i believe the returns are northwards of 9 9.5% as well now what's the <coughs> rationale for somebody who's investing in this fund who should approach this fund why should he approach this funds what are the kind of returns that somebody should expect from such a fund so this is going a, a great fund in that balanced type of space because okay. it has about 45% equity allocation hmm. and, and then there is a little bit of arbitrage component and a debt component so you get a little bit of mix of type of different type of uh, uh shall we say sources of return Plus okay that into one product yeah. of course yeah it it has a tax benefit of like an equity product uh fund is under 2 years old so i can't give you long term sort of track record uh, sure. based predictions but what in in that period we i think managed to deliver something pretty good uh what is really i think what we like about this fund is that it is genuinely balanced so there are a lot of funds in this so called balance space which are between 65 to 80% in equity mm-hmm. and they are not therefore they are not really reflective of any balance they are primarily equity portfolios right uh, so what we have chosen to do uh, uh, is to uh, actually have something which is very close to 50 50 so 45 55 so i think the idea is to provide risk adjusted returns that is to say not pure equity returns uh, and um, yeah i think uh, as long as we are able to deliver the debt and the equity components not to try to blow the lights out but the idea is over a cycle uh, so somebody who wants to invest in the balance fund category yes. so to say this is yes this is a great product in the in that space of what we call hybrid or multi asset products uh, okay. or balance uh, the the terms these terms can and often are interchangeably used but <laughs> various we are using yeah, it, you know. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> so yeah we like to use a uh, i mean given the overuse of balance which is towards equity we kind of use it as hybrid funds uh, to to suggest multi asset fair call uh, yeah. one of the people who asked a question was uh, uh, about and specifically yeah. uh, asking me to ask you was what is your favorite it's a difficult question what is your favorite access amc fund <laughs> if uh, you can answer i think you uh, can't but i leave no, the choice so, to you uh, most of so it, virtually all of the money I, i have personally is invested in access amc funds and i have pretty much every fund in the <laughs> in my my own portfolio what's the maximum allocation uh, <laughs> maximum allocation probably is to a couple of funds that i manage <laughs> okay fair call <laughs> okay 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 cool so that's about the access funds we we'll, we'll, i want to talk to about do you guys about some other themes as well but let me just come to a bit of market flavor as well uh, either of you maybe jinesh maybe siva i was looking at your overall sectoral thematic allocation financials about 33 34% if i'm not wrong consumer discretionary about 23% and then industrials and materials so on and so forth mm. that's a lot of weightage given to financials uh, yeah. i mean and and the the good ones are not cheap be yeah, it yeah. private banks or be it nbfcs it's only the psus which are lagging you would still allocate 34% here and therefore are there a lot more psu names here so we don't have psus in a big you don't have psus, don't okay. have PSUs. and you're still overweight 34% on financial so it includes nbfcs it of includes course. housing finance companies and the private uh, pri- more of a private bank so when i started my career that time also my top holding was trading at four time price to book okay and now also it is trading at three and a half four time price to book the only only execution 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 right which has sustained over a period of let's say now 15 years now Right, 20-25% growth. So you have to identify. Our philosophy is to identify those kind of promoters, those kind of companies who have steadiness in their business model mm. and doesn't get whipsawed when the markets are or when the economy is on a downward trend. Obviously, we'll have some shave off in terms of uh, price movement, but they'll bounce back very smartly. Okay. So 2009, you saw the corrections of 30-40%, but the the so-called PSU is corrected almost like 60-70%. Yeah. So from there, if you see. uh the private banks and sheer nature of india which is public versus private the market share grab what these private banks have and the technological edge what they have versus psus is helping them to grow much faster than the uh, public banks plus the age comes into factor that 
the kind of investments they have done in technology to go to next level of customer acquisition is certainly not there in so so if you take the futuristic view where they are heading how the business model is shaping they might be much ahead of cow as compared to let's say for which if okay. I, if you are asking me why i am owning private banks versus no no i'm just asking you that so, are you okay so, with owning so, such expensive so, financial so names so india is an underbank uh, country you have enough opportunity to grow for next 20 years hmm. you need to find out a company who is doing right things at the ground level which is more of a customer acquisition more of uh, taking on small businesses mean giving loans to smaller entities hmm. and trying to be more granular then going more of a higher corp- corporate loan funding which we are seeing the asset quality issues which have crop up now right so i think the business model is such being created which can sustain for next 20 years hmm. and they are ahead of the curve in terms of technology and other matters sure. so why I, w- i mean if you ask me whether i would buy more answer is yes okay so so financial is a space which is more secular in nature which fits in our philosophy more steady unless and until something goes haywire on the economy and things just collapse okay so then there would be repercussion and these companies have been able to manage their asset quality pretty well as compared to the peers hmm. sure so see ultimately it is risk right yeah how they are managing the risk in the business lending is the most easiest job you can do sure, sure. but how you manage that risk right so we find this type of companies have been able to do it for last 20 30 and years and they will continue so to do that as well sh- hopefully they should continue to do it okay there. seva or jinesh whatever i mean one nbfc is the expensive uh, valuations that they are trading at and two by by ha- not having psu banks you are virtually saying or seem to be saying that the measures that the government is trying to do you will buy into psus only if they yield results you don't want to preempt them i, I think i think what we are trying to say is that okay mm. let me if you look at the last let's say 10 years of data on psu versus uh, uh, the, let's say private the nationalized banks versus private banks you have seen two big cycles of slowdown in credit growth one was in let's say 2008 2010 when you had that sort of in between year the global financial crisis and so on then the things recovered and then again in the last couple of years again you have seen a big slowdown in credit growth mm. what do you see into in if you see the 2008 2009 period is everybody lost business i the entire growth in the system came down so it was a macroeconomic slowdown and everybody took pain equally uh, well, still private sector was growing sure. still faster in this cycle it's this this bis- it's just so stuck the entire slowdown is on account of nationalized banks and private sector banks have continued the growth pace and okay. nbfcs have continued the so if you depending on who you talk to you think there is a huge slowdown in india or everything is doing well who do you rather be with Sure. So there is this entire segment of business which is still growing, uh, and as Dinesh said, what looked expensive 15 years ago is still trading at the same valuation today. Yeah. It says that continue. the book value has grown, compounded at the rate of 20-25 percent per annum. So, so I think it's it's a question of that longer term compounding stories. If you if you are able to stay with that valuation, I think comes second. If you t- our valuations will always catch up if the underlying business growth is strong. Okay, fair call. Uh, final question on markets before I come to actually l- let me try and take two or three questions on funds and then maybe we can take uh, a couple of things that I wanted to ask. Uh, the first question, gentlemen, comes in from a gentleman called Chetan Matre. His handle is Chetan V Matre, and he has said that he wants to invest in an SIP about five thousand rupees a month. He's asking how much can I gain in two three years. from an access sip uh, not necessarily <laughs> any particular fund but an access sip so the fund he's fund agnostic apparently and that. he's asking if people can apply online for it yeah first short answer online yes you know we are um, and we encourage that because it's much easier you get your statements and everything much faster and all that uh, but please take advice first of all if you if you are first time investor into mutual funds figure out what which fund i cannot advise you because i don't know your full financials and uh so please take advice figure out what is right for you in terms of which fund etc to buy uh but having said that uh 2 years 3 years is too short it is 2 years 3 there is a very famous uh, uh quotation from uh, warren buffett from some years ago where he said uh you know if i if i go to a a, a fruit shop and there's they say you know apples are 10% off would you be happy of course you'll be happy You go to a car dealership and you say there's a discount of five percent today on this car. Would you be happy? Of course you'll be happy. You go to a stock market and everything is ten percent off, and you go running for the hills, <laughs> right? So what happens is if you're looking at two years, three years, the chance there's a very decent chance that markets may be down or markets may be. But that's a time to get invested. 
So if you've got a SIP, don't look at two-year returns. Look at the next two years, five years, ten years as a way to invest. And you hope that the markets are reasonably valued during this period. And when you do exit, you want the markets to be expensive. Okay. So, right. So I think I think uh, two years, three years is too short to evaluate. But having said that, Dinesh's point earlier is valid. If the economy grows normally, longer-term expected returns from uh, equities will be uh, it well into double digits. SIPs historically have shown to add a little bit of value on top of that. I.e., your SIP return should be a little better than that. So yes, I think short, you please start. Is my please first. start. Yes. Okay, fair call. Now there's a gentleman called Kunal. Kunal underscore Shaw. He sent some eight or nine questions for you guys. Uh, must be an investor, I don't know. Yeah. But amongst <laughs> the ones that we chose, uh, one of them was, he's asking if you can give an example of an exceptional Axis Bank mutual fund. I'm reading out the question right. as it is, which has performed exceptionally. Was it thematic or sectoral? Axis long-term equity fund, Dinesh. So, <laughs> so both thematic and sectoral, both. So we played India story. Luckily, we went right. Uh, since we are more of an idea generation house and more of a bottom of stock picker, uh, if you take last three four years, we have been able to choose few stories which are like which were at let's say one billion now becoming ten billion, eight billion dollar kind of, and still we are holding on to it. So, so the so so the good part has been we have been able to uh, hold on to those stories and play the entire business cycle rather than just exiting in one year. Hmm. And that has helped us in terms of delivering those kind of returns. Okay. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I would say it's, we, I, we have never done any thematic or sectoral funds. All of yeah. our funds are diversified. diversified. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so the returns may have come from some sectors. For, in, for example, we discussed private banks and NDFCs, for example, uh, but also some of the other sectors that, uh, including consumer names. So the returns may have come from some se sectors because those sectors are the ones which are done really well in this in this sure. cycle, right? Okay. Uh, but it but is you're not, not consciously gone out and chosen to be sector-wise sector allocations. No. Fair call. Uh, there is uh, one more gentleman, uh, Prince Adam, and he says, his his question is, why is it that the Axis Emerging Opportunities Fund is underperforming? I think it's just a two-month-old product. Okay. So, so normally a fund manager takes six months to invest because as the valuations are high, you have to be a bit careful in terms hmm. of investing in the stories. So I think it's just a short period in terms What's of… What's the nature of this fund, Janesh? So it's a close-ended product okay. uh, with three and a half, four years kind of a lock-in mm -hmm. and uh, it is a multi-cap kind of a uh, model. model. And idea is that in uh, three and a half, four years, if you uh, see the entire si business cycle, market cycle, you will end up again that delivery should be in excess of 15% kind of… Uh, written what we are expecting. So there is nothing new in the product in that sense and uh, again it's a diversified portfolio but two months we have still we are still in the mode of investment rather than uh, fully invested. So it takes time. So Okay, uh, final question really uh, either of you again uh, from a view of somebody who is also a direct equity investor and trying to figure out what is it that uh, the brilliant minds sitting in mutual fund houses are betting on. Uh, if you were to get a pot full of money right now, and I'm sure you will, you're probably getting it every month, but a pot full of money suddenly and have to invest of, you know, into areas which you probably haven't had too much of exposure to. So the easy answer is you allocate to financials, you industrial, yeah. industrial so on and so forth. But if you had to look out for new themes, anything that is looking new and interesting, uh, maybe uh, striking to you as an idea that you guys are, you know, kind of uh, researching right yeah. now and may invest in anything on that front. So I think we are trying to look at some of the new emerging themes, be it a healthcare mm -hmm. or healthcare say, isn't uh, emerging. Come on. So so more to do with Dr. Lal type. Okay, fair call. Models, so nothing more consumer B two C rather than B two B type. Standard disclaimer: Dr. Lal is not a recommendation. It's not that they are looking yeah, at it, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah, they are helpful. <laughs> no, no, of course. And it's the uh, least we do at Bloomberg Twenty. Yeah. yeah. So and then there is a. This one small thing what we are looking at it is the stuffing solutions kind of a business model. Mm -hmm. I think worldwide it's a big business to play and we have only one, two companies listed. Right. So we have been investing in those type of new themes I would say. Because to be very frank, India is over research in the sectors which are already, which already seen right. ups and downs I would say, 2003 to 2017 now. So these are the new ideas, new stories where we are looking at. And on the on, on the existing themes, I would say, 
and if you ask me where we are underweight, we are underweight on IT and pharma. Pharma, yes. So IT, we are still again relooking at it. Okay, but you are avoiding pharma completely, right? As of now. As of now. Okay. Great, gentlemen. Any final message to investors that you may want to? I, I, I think we've already got Siv Kumar giving out his message. Start investing <laughs> Start if you've not done already. That is the only way. <laughs> that is the best way yeah, to. Yeah, I, I think. Uh, uh, over the last few years, I think we've seen a dramatic increase in mutual fund participation from investors. But probably, uh, you know, if banking is underpenetrated, then mutual funds haven't even begun Begin starting to penetrate uh, right. with, invest, uh, with, with investors. So, yeah. So hopefully, after this, some of somebody will start. Yeah, in, that indeed, indeed. Yeah. That's the end of this show as well to try and uh, get Engineer, the mutual fund yeah. message to almost the entire nook and corner and hopefully have more participation. But gentlemen, good, good. thank you so much for joining thank in today for, and giving us your thoughts. Lovely having you on the show. And viewers, thank you so much for tuning in.